it, this will sound extreme. Uh, the game's going to start now, so maybe we can pick this up later. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, re return to this point later on. Three, so this is the first match of today. It's going one. to be Gecko versus Axnax. Axnax, of course, everyone knows him from his CPM movies, and he's quite spectacular in that game. But what can he do against Gecko here on Cure? And I don't know if you're familiar with Cure. It is actually yeah, I've already seen it once, I think. Uh, added to the the Quake map, or it's. Um, and for anyone else who is, is new to this map, it's uh, pretty much every major item is has that kind of death trap idea behind it that if you go for it, your positioning is, is so poor that you risk a lot of damage to your opponent being nearby um, as all positions are good to attack onto it. So there is the red pickup uh, by Gecko, and Axe Knight's going to be on to him with a lot of damage, but Gecko just turns around. And I mean, this reminds me a little bit of uh, DM4 in Quake World. DM4, uh, DM4 and Qu oh yeah, okay, okay, DM4, yeah. Because that has the same quality as well with all the major pickups where, in theory, you have to put yourself in a bad position to get them. Yeah, DM4 is, uh, I think, one of the most brutal maps of any Quake game ever to learn, to be honest. It's horrendous. I mean, hard. it really shouldn't have been a competitive map. It's just, it's a bit retarded, but, but it, there's yeah. not many dual maps in Quake World, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. So right now Gecko does have the advantage, uh, Axnax needs to try to build up. He's got to just stay away from Gecko as much as he can, and this is so much a map awareness issue over reading your opponent at this point for Axnax, and he just he goes down quite easily there to Gecko. Gecko's going to get a follow-up frag also at the red armor. So Axnax is really in terrible danger of just completely losing the grip of this game because Gecko is running around with 200-200 and so far it's just looked that looked like Axnax doesn't even really know the map. No, I think he doesn't know the map. Which is quite possible uh, being a CPM player and, and not someone who's necessarily played a huge amount of Quake Live Duel or, or who actively plays a lot, but someone who just loves to play Quake. But he is a very talented player, so it would be very encouraging to see him playing more of these cups, to be honest. Uh, also, actually, Kyum may or may not be in the next map pool because there's only four cups and we change map every season. Ooh, that was nice. Gecko taking down Axnax again in style. And see, yeah. unfortunately, I can't remember what all those cooler like reactions were. Otherwise, I'd like mock some of those. Like, it's like, eh, eh, eh. I can't, can't even remember what he did, but they were like oh, classic reactions. Here? Yeah. <laughs> They're just making sounds like, Brr, and stuff like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. like. <laughs> <laughs> The problem is, Cooler is so cool that even when he does that, it still sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're completely right. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. Speaking of which, actually, next week, if anyone is an Issue fan, Issue's actually going to be joining us for a Sunday Cup as well. So mark that in your calendars if you are an Issue fan. A lot of people like, I don't know if you caught that, that uh, incarnation of Face It TV, but when Issue came on, he, um, he's, he works part-time. In on a farm in Germany. Okay, in the story is killing me right now, so I'll tie this in, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he uh, he was just giving us loads of allegories from the farm. Oh, okay. And it was proved to be extremely entertaining. Uh, anyways, uh, Gecko okay. still not really having any trouble with Axnax at all. To be honest, it's looking like a no contest. So it was sort of like the George Orwell's Animal Farm of, of Quake Live dueling. <laughs> <laughs> animal Farm. Impressive. I had a, I had a I, I knew someone who wrote a huge fan fiction like follow up to that. <laughs> a fan fiction follow up. Yeah, okay. like, like a sequel. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like one of the, the teachers from my school, and he he actually got fired like a few weeks <laughs> after I, so I heard sounds, about that. Sounds justified. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you mean just because it was such like a vehement political screed? It was like <laughs> combination between that and the fact that he would spend all of his classes just writing his book whilst just making the kids yeah. watch a movie every single class. So yeah, he wasn't the best teacher in the world. But Axnax is also finding it getting pretty schooled by Gecko here. And Gecko here. has pretty good rockets, at least on this yeah. map where you can. There's not that many places for them to dodge, but it seemed pretty accurate so far. No, Ge Gecko. Gecko is definitely not to be messed around with. I mean, he has like a, a great fundamental skill set, a series of um, a series of skill sets that work very well in tool. Like he's got pretty much all the basic qualities that can amount that can grow into a good a good jewel. A, a strong dual game, but he's just uh, he's just one of the newer players. So maybe you know he's someone to look at in a year, but he's definitely been making a, a lot of progress recently, and he's someone to, not, not one to mess with. I mean, you with. can see here that Axler doesn't really understand the layout of the map in terms of once he misses the item, he doesn't know where to go next. Yeah, I, I think it was extremely telling as well, right at the start of the game when 
I mean, because everyone knows, um, anyone who knows Axe knows that he's someone who does know how to play Quake, regardless of how good or not he is at Jewel. He's going to understand the basic principle that if you're heavily outstacked, you don't just run into your opponent. You need to be avoiding them to try and either get a superior position or try to build up some stack and then get a superior position to do something. But he didn't have like the awareness on the map, quite clearly, to avoid Gecko. Like, in, in a very simple, simple way, the way he, he got caught was just like, it really looked like he was clueless. On, on Gecko, on where Gecko could be. So that just shows a huge lack of map knowledge. But uh, I mean, I'm not sure this is the best map, to be honest, but it looks like a little bit limited. Have we ever seen any really good games on it? There have been some good games on it. Like it's, who, uh, who do you think of when you say that? Uh, anything involving 0-4 or Rafa or... Okay. That, those two in particular have really good games here. Uh, also, do a lot of North America. They they put, really put a huge focus on, on getting good here because this is a new map put into the Quake on map pool, and, and those guys really like the activity really surged in North America going into going into that. Also, the Hangers had some good games here as well. Um, it's quite interesting that I can't think very quickly of any European names. Well, the funny thing is, since I mentioned this was a bit like DM4, the problem with DM4 okay is it looks like such a furious map if people rush each other that you think there's not very much skill to it. It's just spamming certain corners and then trying to jump in yeah. and jump past the rocket and then kill someone. So it seems very only fighting skills based. But actually the big problem that DM4 had was that very early on in the game, it was actually one of the few maps that was ever solved strategically because there's basically there's a very simple game theory that it, like never fails on DM4. So for example, if the opponent goes down uh, below to get the red armor before he comes out of the teleporter when he's in the upper area, yeah. If he goes there, then according to game theory, he should never leave unless he's being fully spammed from above because otherwise he goes into that place where he's vulnerable at the bottom and he can be killed. Yeah. So he should just, if he's even one frag up, he should go there, wait on the armor and just sit there until the, he knows the opponent is above him and then he can run out the bottom. Yeah. Same as when he yeah. runs into the area that has the mega health, he should never leave there if he has a if he has an advantage. So unfortunately, in real competition, it was a terrible map because of this reason, because it had sort of been solved and you were giving up obvious advantages if you even actually played the game once yeah. you were up a lead. But the real issue is that it never really was a competitive game in 1v1 in Duel. It was played more for fun in an online cup, so it never yeah. mattered as much. But that's the problem that certain maps have. If they can be solved strategically, then if you were to give them to a player like a 0-4 or a Rafa, they will win a lot, but they probably will make the game not look so good because of how they control yeah. it, you know? It actually, you know, DM4 is really interesting as well because um, on DM4, like you said, there's no reason for that guy to come out. So what would end up happening a lot of the time, I noticed, was that it became a, a game of basically trying, obviously trying to throw someone off in a, and there's like so many double bluffs going on yeah. and, and also counting um, counting ammunition because you, you want it to be sp spamming in certain spots. Um, otherwise, it could it could be safe for your friends to come out, or maybe not safe for them to come out. They have to make the guess. But eventually, they run out of rockets, and then at that point, they can't they, they can't be in a situation where then you then you come out and they have no rockets. So that can't happen. So they have to go back for rockets. Yeah. So the, so the other guy can, if he's counting correctly, can realize then when it's safe to come out, or he can do a fake jump to throw off some spam somewhere so that there is an opening for him to come out. So that even though like there's this like solved really simple thing going on, it's actually like there's a huge meta game element there. Well, I mean, you know, that's what happened simplicity. actually in Quake World in general. That was the de strategical development was that it became about counting armor because they played the modes where the, the gun stayed off. Yeah. And so we never saw this in Quake 3 or Quake Live. People who haven't followed that game will find it a surprising idea. Like you'd be counting how many rockets someone has because in Quake Live, you either go and get another weapon, so no problem, or you just go and get the same weapon again and you get a couple more pieces of ammunition off it. Whereas the key thing in Quake World was it, the tiers meant that the best weapons were the ones you had to use all the time and you couldn't just pick them up over and over. You had to control the armor as well. Uh, the uh, ammunition rather. Hmm. I mean this game here is pretty much over so do we have any idea what the next map is? Uh, this is Death of One. Oh of okay. One phases, so. uh, quite unfortunate that Hashtag let himself get caught on a map that I think quite clearly he has no experience on, or very limited experience on. So as far as uh, the next game goes, I don't believe I've been informed as to what that would be just yet, but I'm sure there's still a wealth of choice of options. In fact, we at some point we should, we should take a quick look at the brackets just to see how things are turning out, how things are progressing. And I mean, one thing we noticed when we had a little look earlier, though, was that the top half of the bracket is nearly all the famous names, yeah. and the bottom half is a bit dry. 
Yeah, we, on the bottom half, it's like, there's, we, I think Agent was down there and Matchbox and Twister and... Uh, but yeah, there's That's about it, though, people like Sparty and Pavel and, and Kula and Ash. Ash are on the top half and Faz. All in the top half. Yeah. That's, yeah, I'm just checking it out now quickly. Yeah, Brattler is also in the bottom half, but of course he's not, he's not quite uh, as big of a name. Although he is very good. For example, um, like you said, like uh, in your opinion, which I think is f it's fair to say, you're saying you know, Faz, in, in your opinion, is a very overrated player. Um, I mean, I said that off air, which is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but I think, I think he, I think he yeah. could agree with you in a sense. I mean, he's also someone who doesn't really play necessarily for anything more than just like sheer enjoyment of the competition. Yeah. Like he's not trying to be a professional player. Like, um, like you could really say, like Rafa, I think, is the, the quintessential example of someone who takes himself extremely seriously. No, he's the seriously. ultra professional, yeah. Exactly. Very like competitive guy. Um, so it's kind of like a different w like reason to play the game. But uh, Faz, of course, is able to have these amazing games with a lot of these players. But Brattle is actually someone that can, can take someone down like Faz. He's someone that can take someone okay. like Sparty down. Um, Aginan, as well, is, is on that level. Um, the only person that I don't think is vulnerable to those kind of players playing today is maybe, uh, maybe Ash Cooler and Ash Cooler. I, I don't want to say Pavel because sometimes we just see Pavel just get randomly knocked out. So I don't want to say Pavel, but you know how there is there is a tier of player wh where they just don't lose to, to well, some people. Well, the thing is, someone like a Cooler, in general, plays to a certain level no matter what opponent he faces, yeah. and so to beat Cooler, usually you have to outplay him. He's not going to like go down to your level and then mess up and then yep. you beat him. You have to actually rise to his level and then exceed him. That's one of the things that I always thought Kula and Rafa were amazing at, like the, the consistency they could get to their game. Whereas you think of someone like Avek and Cypher, and actually they were much more wild. They could win the tournament and then they could come fifth in the next tournament. Whereas Kula and Rafa, if they got the right draw, were always going to reach the semifinals. You could almost like book them in, you know. It reminded me almost sort <laughs> of like in tennis, yeah. when someone like uh, Roger Federer had this streak where he made like something ridiculous, like 20 semifinals in a row or something. And the point was, you, he could be beaten, but he was never going to play below a certain level. So you had to come up to his level if you wanted to get to that spot. Otherwise, he was a, a guaranteed person to get to the top mm. four. And on that note, we'll go to a very, very short break. When we come back, we actually have Luke and Sparty ready to play. So we're going to see our first glimpse of Sparty in his form. So stay tuned. We'll be right back.